The front is thin. At night we receive orders to distance ourselves from the enemy. To the south, the Bolsheviks have succeeded at breaking deep into the front. Our right flank has been seriously threatened. Overnight, the Reds took Dmitry Yeskoya. Our group is supposed to retreat to Troyskoya. One squad, our squad, remains behind for protection. The enemy tries to push after us. All day long, the rattling of machine guns does not stop. All day long, the squad huddles in their holes and defends themselves against the enemy. Only on the following night is our squad able to meet up with the battalion, find our way through the snow desert with the help of a compass, and take a new position near Troyskoye, which the Sturmpioneeren have blasted into the icy ground. Grey clouds cover the skies. Mighty untamed storms drive icy needles into our faces. Up in the black trees, crows are cawing. This time, though, we fare better, taking turns so that we can warm ourselves inside the dilapidated huts. There we sit and stare into the open fire. Each of us is occupied in his own thoughts. There is great unrest inside me. I feel that some sort of enormous atrocity is brewing against us. As my comrades all of a sudden cling blindly to my predictions, good or bad, I must not show my feelings. The crackling wood also allows our thoughts to wander down pleasant paths. We are thinking of home. The devil knows what kind of winter it would have been, someone says, not having to finish his sentence. We all know what he means. If this barrel would have started rolling, which was hit so hard near Bialystok and Minsk, near Gomel and Kiev, and near Bryansk or Vyasma, what kind of winter would it have been back in Germany? These days we think about this often. After intensive preparation work by the artillery, the Russians attack in the early morning hours, and what an attack it is. The fight is hopeless. New and more masses flood toward us. Within a short time, and backed up by tanks, they succeed at driving deep wedges into the line on both sides of Troyskoye. By noon we are already encircled. Unit YJR 214, which is rushing to our aid, is completely decimated by the Reds, save 14 men, who push their way through to us. Later we found the horribly mutilated corpses lying in heaps. Poor boys. They had come fresh from the west, from Beovitz. What were they to know about these Caucasian monsters and their methods of fighting? The situation is becoming more and more desperate. We wire to Oberjan. Group Petersdorf is trapped, send support. At 19.10 hours, we receive the answer. Break through the encirclement, rush to Oberjan. A 22 centimetres bullseye could not have been any more devastating than this cable. For heaven's sake, is it really that bad? Is Oberjan already being threatened? Are the neighbouring battalions in retreat? These are the questions buzzing from one person to the next among us. The shooting has decreased. It appears as if they are boozing it up on the other side. A victory celebration. The storm carries their yelling and wailing. Their drunkenness brings us luck. Their cannons are blown up. Vehicles and provisions burned. Shortly after midnight, the breakthrough succeeds amidst terrible losses. At six o'clock hours, the remainder of Group Petersdorf reaches Obojan. The details of what happened on this march could never be described in words. Fleeing in 35-degree freezing temperatures and 75 centimetres of snow from a superior force that is ten times larger. Only the healthy are able to make it with their last bit of strength. The injured, heavily or lightly, are lost in the snow, lying down and freezing to death, or butchered by the Reds. We now know that most of them spared themselves this fate by a final bullet. Obojan is put on defensive alert. In the morning, a rare spectacle of nature. The sun rises three times. It looks quite bizarre. This strange phenomenon is most likely caused by light deflection in the icy air, which is oversaturated with snow crystals. We do not have the time to stand for long and witness this. It is difficult to explode trenches into the ground which is frozen solid. The Russian population has a different experience. They are standing together in hordes and staring open-mouthed into the winter sky. Many throw themselves onto the hard ground, crying and screaming. The babushkas are on their knees, a sign from heaven. Death and destruction is going to come over the city. We already know this, even without an omen from the sky. Within two days, life and death will be decided here. 
A few thousand Russians with strong tank forces are closing in on the city with only minimal resistance. The god-damned 40 kilometers gap in the front line. It had to happen this way. Heinz Stickel has returned from Germany. He tells lots of beautiful stories from back home, but also brings news of the horrible famine in the Ukraine. They had a two-day layover in Kiev. Here it is the worst. Hundreds are starving to death each day. Packs have been put into position on the streets and squares in order to extinguish right away any possible uprisings. One single small frozen potato now costs 45 RM, a loaf of bread, 25 RM. The city's population treks in masses far outside the town, often 30 kilometres away, to fields frozen solid in order to dig for potatoes with iron crowbars and axes. On both sides of the supply roads are figures clothed in rags, waiting for one of the small panji horse to keel over from exhaustion. Like vultures, they scramble over the dying animal. Its body still warm and twitching, they cut into it and greedily take large chunks of meat, which never happens without any thrashing. Dear homeland, be content with the few meat coupons you have. At noon, Russian bombers appear out of the blue, circling for an hour over the city. One after another unloads its explosive cargo. Many houses burst into flames. At the end, pamphlets are dropped in huge quantities. They are directed at the civilian population. The contents, comrades, leave Obojan. We are going to raise the city to the ground. Hey, not so fast. What about us? We are still here after all. Nevertheless, a large portion of the population leaves the city with all of their belongings in hand, which is not a mistake. This way we at least have some space. In the evening we receive the bad news that a large supply and medical echelon was attacked and destroyed 25 kilometres from here, near Yakublewo. This comes as a heavy blow. The railway to bielgorod charkow is the lifeline for 300 kilometres of the fighting front line. Its destruction by the enemy means the following. No ammunition, no reinforcements, no provisions. During the night we receive orders to form two reconnaissance units which are to be deployed in the direction of Yakublewo. After heavy bombardment during the night, we leave the city at dawn. At around nine o'clock hours, we reach the location of the attack. The wreckage of a large truck is still smoking. In the streets and ditches lie the horribly mutilated bodies of our comrades. The chest of a lieutenant has been ripped open. Intestines are lying in blood-soaked snow. Only the heart is missing. We know from the events of the last few days that these savages, this Asian tundra scum, have eaten the hearts of the brutally slaughtered officers. Think of Carl May's Indian Wars. The driver's cabin of an ambulance is painted red with blood from the injured that have been massacred. Mail is scattered in the snow. Photographs of wives and children, the nicest Christmas present for loved ones on the front, are now soiled with blood. I read a small card with two small pictures attached to it. Dear Dad, this is me, your Inga, and dear Mama. I have grown so big. When are you coming home? Little Ing, he will never come home, your Dad. Damn, tears are welling up in my eyes. We leave this place of horror. One of the reconnaissance units under Lieutenant Simons branches off to the right of the street. I myself and my ten men and two machine guns take off to the east. After a good hour of burdensome marching in high snow, we reach a miserable little village. No trace of the enemy. The locals are interrogated with pistols drawn against them. During the night, the Reds supposedly left this place and are lying in wait with a force of 500 men in the neighbouring village. There are approximately 800 metres between them and us. And even more important is the fact that there is a gorge in between. It would be insanity to try and penetrate this with my men. This much I know I must do. Very carefully I bring our two machine guns to the ridge of the gorge and place them into position. I am lying with my binoculars on a hill overlooking the ridge. Upon my signal, the machine guns suddenly bark out several rounds of ammunition. First, there is nothing to be seen. But then, they come running out of their huts, all scrambling. The officers are cursing and screaming. It is total chaos. My boys are shooting well, and considering the great distance, an astonishing number are hit and collapse. But then it whistles back at us from the other side. It is high time to clear out. 
Two hours later, we meet up at the pre-arranged location with the other group, which did not have any enemy contact. Tomorrow we will come back and smoke out this gang of Schweind. We do not know yet, but how will this play out differently? Half frozen, we reach Oberjan in the evening. On our way, we were attacked by Ratas. Unfortunately, two men were injured. In our quarters, there is lots of partying, for the supply office has given out suspiciously large amounts of liquor, the finest French cognac, Hennessy. Someone says, The defence ministry is having a sale, gentlemen, it stinks. A little later, we will all know just how right he was. Oh, Scheisse, today is New Year's Eve, and we are all buying ourselves one hell of a hangover. Maybe it will be the last one we have in this lifetime. In that case, cheers, comrades. This night is turning out very badly. Chains of red bombers arrive without let-up. By morning, entire streets have been reduced to rubble. The mission to raise the city to the ground has begun. Near Dmitry Yoskoye, Group Barkman is defending itself desperately against a superior enemy force. Here, just like everywhere else, everyone is giving his all in order to protect Oberjan. If the city falls, there will be a gap in the front for hundreds of kilometres, and no longer a connection between Charkow and Kursk. Access to the well-built railroad would thus be lost. It is very unfortunate that the Bargman Battalion is missing its supply of shells. Fourteen trucks have been loaded with ammunition. The protection of the crews is taken over by Neckham and me, along with two groups. We are attacked near Kruzowo by strong tank forces. Those 52-ton tanks squash our vehicles like they were toy trucks, and the ammunition carried inside them explodes. The tracks of the armoured vehicles make pulp of the injured. With a heavy anti-tank rifle, we shoot and ignite a medium tank just 10 metres away. Then they roll at us, and we are running half crazy with horror for 20 metres. The bullets are whistling behind us. Damn! I throw myself into the deep snow, hitting my head on a tree stump, bleeding like a pig. My God! The lungs are rattling. The eyes are caked with blood. I am at the end of my strength. Still, up again, running, only running. If I could just reach the forest over there. Where on earth are the others? Again, bullets are scraping my ears. From the right side, there are ten or more Red Army soldiers running at me. This is the end. Then suddenly there comes the thought. It is the last shot at saving this little life, this straw of consciousness. I run some few steps more. Again, the bullets are coming at me. Then I throw my arms into the air, turn around on my own axis, and then I let myself fall down. The Reds arrive, step on my chest and stomach. They see the blood on the face and on the uniform. I can discern the words Krauge, blood, Mjotwuj, dead, and Soldat Mushij, simple soldier. They are just about to empty my pockets or undress me, when there is loud screaming and cursing from the tanks. It must be orders directed at these guys. Dusk is falling and they probably want to get lost. They let go of me, a kick with the foot for a farewell and they are gone. I am saved, damn it, indeed saved. These pigs took with them my machine gun and my field hat. Luck must be with the simple soldier. I have been saved by my missing braids and EK band and the blood on my face. Carefully I move into a shallow fold in the ground, which stretches all the way to the forest. Under the protection of the first trees it is over, and it grips me, the crying of the nerves. Chest and stomach are hurting from the kicks of the reds. Nevertheless, further on, just move on. It is terribly cold and I cannot stay put here. Hypothermia comes quickly. I take my socks off and wrap them around my head in order to protect it against the cutting ice air. The night is moonlit, and by detour I reach Krasnikawa. Toward the direction of Obojan, the sky is blood red. The low thunder of the detonating bombs can be heard clearly. Where are the others? How many could escape the slaughter? These are the thoughts that keep going through my head and will not allow me any rest. The marching group has been cut to pieces. Nekam and myself are in Obojan. Supposedly there are still three men on their way here. We are the only survivors. Now I have been admitted into the club of the corpses. Eight men who were yesterday in the same situation as I was carry the honorary title of corpse. Now I am the ninth one. These are men who I will gladly take along on reconnaissance and frontline missions. Again the chains of enemy bombers arrive. It is the beginning of events to come. The daily order of the general who is with us and remains here with his staff is read. 
Obajan will hold out until the last man has died. A general joins the defence line with his weapon in his hand. A hail to the Führer and the men take up their positions. The main access roads are secured against tanks by mines. We form veils of shooters as well as advanced posts, which are now all occupied. Every available man has to lend a hand. The first alarming news arrives. Only four kilometres southeast of the city, the Reds are advancing with strong troops and tanks. Group Bargman retreats, bitterly fighting back to Oberjan. Also in the north, near Field Watch 2, strong tank noises. From a different position comes the news of Russians advancing by trucks. With senses and nerves on high alert, the defenders of the city await the attack in an area of two square kilometres. Heavy tanks put their feelers out here and there, but remain outside shooting range. Towards the evening we have been completely surrounded. Shortly before 22 o'clock, in complete darkness, there is the first attack in the south and east. In the south it is met and rejected with bloody close combat. In the east, however, the enemy is successful in making deep progress. Ear-shattering explosions are ringing through the streets. The Reds fire into the city from all sides. The noise of the exploding and detonating bullets is amplified a thousandfold, and from all sides tracer fire is crossing. Tank grenades shred into the houses. Burning roof timbers and rafters smash into the street. The air is full of singing and chirping. Nobody knows where the shots are coming from. Across the street, the Bolsheviks are sitting in the gardens. The corpses go on another spying mission. The quarter is barricaded and the Reds are thrown out in a counter-attack. But again and again they are running at us from the south and the east. In the south, the attack of the Reds stops immediately in front of our lines. Field Watch West reports that the enemy is moving closer and closer to the city. Here a deep valley traverses the terrain from west to northwest, which separates the city from the suburban villages. In this valley lies our most important water source. All day long there is heavy field fire right here. Fetching water alone is paid by numerous losses. A brave raiding party finally gets us some air. Late in the afternoon, enemy tanks are closing in on the city. Equipped with Molotov cocktails and gasoline canisters, we man our defensive position. Sufficient hand grenades are kept ready and close by, and the flamethrowers are put on alert. The colossal beasts are nearing, firing wildly, until they are in reach of our outmost position, which has the order to let them pass through. But angrily we have to recognise that they dare not enter. After a short while they disappear behind a ground elevation and attack the city from there, firing directly without pause. With the setting of dusk all hell breaks loose again. The 7.5 shells of the tanks are ripping huge holes in the rows of defenders. The huge pairs of the heavy mortars arrive gurgling in the air. Bombers destroy with 200-pound bombs whole street quarters. The city is burning at every corner. The losses are enormous. I have been on my legs now for many days and nights. I follow my orders feverishly, do reconnaissance, operate the machine guns, the artillery, throw hand grenades. Every single man fights unimaginably. Twenty-five times the Russians attacked today with tank support. Many times tonight the pig has infiltrated the city for a short time. In our counter-attacks we threw him back each time. We men are standing like iron in the defence despite terrible losses and terrible temperatures. 42 degrees C. For a large part with frostbitten hands and feet. Being sick is not an option. We are fighting for our bare life. We receive the order to burn all files and boxes, personal, paper and map material. The trucks with luggage and equipment are being prepared for detonation. The pressure of the Reds is huge. If that is not enough, now ammunition and provisions are becoming scarce. In the morning, a heavy tank is blown up by 8.8 centimetres flak artillery. The infiltrating enemy is destroyed. Among other things, they have incinerated our provision storage. There are dead bodies lying in the snow, army bread tucked under their arms. At noon, air raid alarm. With muffled roars, they are approaching. But what is that? A squadron of our heavy bombers, finally. They circle, push deeper and deeper, three times, four times they fly over us at close height. The bomb shoots open. There, in the middle of the city, the rows of bombs are falling, parachutes are opening, deployment of ammunition. The Russians are shooting like there is no tomorrow. 
it sounds strangely close in the clear winter air. A heavy load is lifted off our chests when we see the floating parachutes come down. Finally, there is help from the leadership. On one of the ammunition shells, somebody wrote with chalk, Hold on, we are coming. You bet we will hold on. Ammunition is at hand again, and roasted cats and roasted dogs do not taste that bad either. The mood barometer points to nice weather. We have to succeed. In the south, there is loud fighting to be heard. Group Postler is supposed to attack there in order to bring relief to the occupation of Obajan. Right now, we sense nothing of the sort. To the contrary, in the northern part of the city, the enemy succeeds in infiltrating with a battalion. The fire of their mortars lies heavy on the spot of the breakthrough. This time the situation is very grave, because the attack is supported directly with tanks. In the evening the heavy battle is still raging in full force. Our quarter is again barricaded. Tank shells, flares and explosives are whistling through the street. One block of houses bursts up in flames, in its eerie glow, we see the Reds jumping their short steps, a good target for our machine guns. At midnight, two centimetres anti-aircraft artillery is put in position, and that cleans it up. In the hardest fighting, man against man, the Bolsheviks are thrown back. A small scene should illustrate what kind of tough enemy we are dealing with. While advancing with my group, we are cleaning a garden. In a foxhole, we discover a wounded Russian officer. I yell out to him, Rukij war! Raise your hands. His answer, given with a smile, goes, And yet, no. A hand grenade thrown in his hole rips him to pieces. At a hedge close to the end of the garden, there is a badly injured red. Shell splinters have ripped the fingers off his hands. The legs seem to be smashed as well. We are five steps away. Brightly, he lies in the light of a burning house. When he sees us approaching, he makes a lightning-fast move and rips off a hand grenade with his teeth and lies his head on it. Lie down! And already the hand grenade explodes with a hollow thud. Vogel, who is slow on the pickup, did not make it to the ground. A dozen splinters ram through his body. He dies within the following hour. During the course of the night, the most beautiful news of these hard days arrives from the division. A battalion, IR-217, stands with its spearhead eight kilometres south of Oberjan. A patrol immediately makes contact. This time the corpses are spared from this mission. During the early morning hours, the brave infantrymen succeed in breaking through the pincer movement. It is high time that they arrive, because our losses already amount to 1-3. A raiding party of the enemy makes it to the city centre. We catch them at the field post office. Lying behind the filled sacks of mail, we have erected a considerable barricade out of them. We are firing like mad at them. Then we attack with hand grenades and at the point of the bayonet, for the danger is extreme. Twenty steps further there lies the general and his staff. Those gentlemen also open fire from all the windows of the staff quarters. And then an image which I will never forget, free standing on a balcony, our best comrade, a white-haired officer, our general Neuling. Without a care about the whistling of the bullet bursts, he is unloading his machine gun into the rows of the attackers. Suddenly, to the surprise of friend and enemy, there is loud rattling and hissing, and two or three times a terrible burst of fire comes from a cellar window to the right onto the street. Flamethrowers. The effect is terrible. Corpses burned beyond recognition are lying in black lumps on the street. The remaining Bolsheviks are fleeing in horror. But our machine gun bursts reach the fleeing. The enemy patrol is destroyed completely. A little bit later, a heavy attack supported by tanks calls us to the northeastern part of the city. The red hordes arrive, screaming a shrill, Hurrah! Mortars and tank shells transform our defensive position, the Kolchos Yard, within the shortest time into rubble. Half of the defenders are dead or wounded. Our artillery fires at a 52-ton caterpillar. But not one shell penetrates the thick armour plating. We want to despair. Now our second machine gun gives out due to a direct hit. Officer Nold is dead. The other two who armed it are heavily wounded. We demand reinforcement, but they cannot come through because there is heavy fighting in the west as well as in the east. Finally, after 30 horrible minutes, a tank and an assault gun arrive, and the latter shoots down a Charkow tank. We are advancing our counterattack, and what a miracle. The Reds are retreating. With the fall off dusk we pick up chores, which we had missed, 
The whole area in the front is mined by our pioneers despite very dense combat fire of the enemy. The mess of noon today will not be repeated soon. Our losses today are damn high. During the night, heavy attacks of red bombers in rolling waves, strong mortar fire, some infantry attacks. All in all, it is quieter than during the last few nights, nearly too quiet. We are suspecting something devilish. The large cupola of the North Church, an extraordinarily beautiful building, seat of the important B position, is fired at and ignites. In a bursting rain of embers, the tower collapses. Bright as daylight, the fire illuminates the northern position. Every man, every single gun is clearly visible from above. Like hawks, the bombers bear down on our trenches. Their bombs brings us many losses. But the airplanes are bathed in red light as well, and our machine guns and the two centimetres anti-aircraft artillery take aim like wild at the good targets. God knows they succeed. A heavy bomber is hit and crashes burning into a field. Great is the jubilation, more even as the others are scurrying away. There is absolute quiet in the direction of Streliskaya, not a single shot fired from over there. The eternal attacks probably will have also tired out the enemy. They will be asleep over there, as they can, because they determine the pace of the action, not us. Maybe they assemble their powers for a counterattack? Who knows? But we have to find out. A reconnaissance troop goes out. With utmost care the men are stalking toward the village. There is utter quiet in Streliskaya. Few posts are standing around, bored and freezing. Without them noticing, we return at 5 a.m. to Obojan. In a hurry, we assemble a strong raiding party with two PKs. Even assault guns are included. At 5.30 a.m., we penetrate Streliskaya. The surprise of the sleeping Russians is 100% successful. Most of them do not even get the chance to get up. Without mercy, everything and everybody is gunned down or clubbed to death on their sleeping cots. The whole nightmare lasts about a half hour. Streliskaya burns down to the ground. In every hut, there are 20 to 30 dead Russians. The houses become places of cremation. Today, we know that more than 360 Russians fell victim during the bloodbath. Well, you Asian pack, you certainly did not dream of that. At 7 a.m., we have already taken up our positions again in the line of defence. The heavy mortars beat into the city. Machine gun salvos are whipping through the streets, the usual, at noon again, a resupply of ammunition and provisions. Otherwise, nothing unusual. It is calm, alarmingly calm. At 15.00 hours, there is suddenly the heaviest shooting. Now we are in the know. The Reds are ready for the counterattack. At the same hour, an order arrives from headquarters. Tomorrow morning at 9am, an attack manoeuvre is to be undertaken. Group Dostler pressures from the south, the occupying forces will be trapped within the shortest time in this scissor formation, if they do not get possession of Obojan this very night. Tonight our fate will be determined. At 20.00 hours, the concentrated storm on the city begins. At different locations, the enemy succeeds in breaking through. In bloody close combat, he is beaten, breaks through again at different places infiltrates the field hospital and causes a horrific bloodbath among the wounded. With limitless fury we force him back again, not being in control of our senses. We are shooting, stabbing and beating around us like in the throes of madness. On a ward in a side wing of the hospital, there has been a horrible struggle. The Reds do not have any more hand grenades. With long sticks the Caucasians beat at us. With our rifles, we force them towards the windows and throw them hand over feet out the windows into the yard. I look terrible. The hands are bleeding. The uniform is ripped, soiled with brain matter and dirt. A tank shell rips howling through the outer wall. A hand-sized fragment rips the head off the body of my companion. Nothing happens to me. Damned. Am I immune? Up until the early morning hours, there is bitter fighting in all street quarters. With the breaking of dawn, the attack has finally been defeated. The pressure of Group Dostler approaching from the south onto the deep open flank of the enemy is definitely discernible. Around 10 a.m. the enemy attempts another breakthrough in the north, but with the aid of our two storm cannons, this undertaking is stopped and squashed right in its inception. Outside the heavy firing, the day passes in relative calm. The hour has arrived when we, together with our infantry, assemble for the counterattack. 
At around 21.00 hours, our own intelligence reports that the enemy is retreating toward the northwest while leaving a rear guard. He must retreat because he is forced to do so from the outside. The connection with Group Dostler stands. The retreating enemy is nearly completely destroyed. The remaining troops are forced eastward. The small, brave fighting group of Obajan takes a roll call at the main city centre, where there remains not one building standing. The general, who was awarded the Knight's Cross the day before, thanks his men. He reads a thank you telegram from the Fuhrer, which makes us all very proud. We can hardly believe it. Obajan is free again, and free is the connection to the rear areas in Kursk and Charkow. Finally, there is something to eat, and finally we can sleep in. Unimaginable hard days lie behind us, bitter fighting at temperatures of 45 degrees Celsius. But despite everything we held on to Obajan, thus honouring our dead comrades, they will not have died in vain. The heavy casualties of these fights are demonstrated by the following numbers. Dead are 195 men missing in action, 18 men wounded. 327 men, 65 of whom are suffering from exposure of the severest degree. 540 brave men gave their blood, 540 of 1130 defenders. I believe numbers speak louder than words. What the Russians had planned and their overwhelming manpower is demonstrated in the following order, which we intercepted from a captured lieutenant. It refers to the large-scale attack of January 8th and 9th. O must be taken under all circumstances during the night of 1 8th, 1 9th. Available are 16 battalions, assuming 500 men per battalion we were looking at at 8,000 men, and heavy weaponry. From 17.00 hours until 20.30 hours O is to be attacked with all available artillery and tanks in order to be stormed. At 20.30 hours, the battalion Patauka will break through the German outpost in the north, will battle through the outer city fortification and will march in spearhead formation towards the south of the city. After successfully reuniting with our own troops stationed in the south, the city is to be annexed according to plan. In order to prevent the enemy from escaping from Obojan, the Samanyu, Timansko and Lachivirkar battalions will form a blockade to the northeast and east. An additional regiment will take care of the south, Omsk. Battalions, Maxim Gorky 2 and 3 will traverse from the north to the northeast, thereby regaining the connection to those stationed in the south. Again, please refer to the Special Command of December 17th, 41. This Special Command, issued by Stalin, which we have known about since Christmas, states this among other things. In the future, the only Germans I want to see are dead Germans. Oh well, those horrible days are over and the Bolsheviks have had to reckon without their host. We too seldom take prisoners now. Sleeping, sleeping, and more sleeping. A strong, agile raid party is formed under the leadership of Colonel Hackel. At various locations to the east of Obajan, there continues to be heavy fighting. The Reds succeeded on January 1st, just at the 11th hour, in leading two regiments through the gap near Rashawa, who were to provide reinforcements to the occupiers. We would have fared really badly had they been able to advance more quickly. The two regiments rejoined those who were flooding back, forcing the combat to continue near Wurch Dunajez. In a forced march, our assault detachment is thrown there. The fighting and the cold over the last few weeks have worn us out badly. My men are only skin and bones, and the corpses now truly have a deathly pallor about them. Ever since the early morning hours, we have been labouring through the goddamn snow. For hours now, the storm has been blowing across the land. It eats through our coat and any protective clothing. It curdles the blood and petrifies our bones so much so that the freezing temperatures feel like a biting pain in all our nerves. By now, only the long poles, which are standing in the snowdrifts on the sides of the roads, show us the way. Darkness is falling upon us. The long nights now stand over this land, where a relentless wind from the tundra rushes over the solemn white distances, cold as a knife under the merciless blinking stars. At minus 40 degrees C, our weapons speak a terrible language. Who has not, during these winter days, and indeed how many times, been called to the utmost limits of his strength? After a short rest in a run-down hut, no one is allowed to sleep, although we are dog-tired and just about at the end of our strength. 
we carry on. At daybreak, we reach Wirch Dunajez. The enemy is sitting before us at Saikin and Plotawo. Our infantry comrades, whose ranks we now join, tell us about the Reds over there. These are new forces which have been brought over from the Soviet Far East, reserves whom the Soviet leadership believes will change their luck in this war to their favour this winter. Yesterday our infantry took Wirch Dunajez. The rubble is still smouldering. They are a crazy bunch, those Caucasians, Kyrgyzians and Mongols. Stoically they stay put in their snow dugouts when resistance is hopeless. Perhaps they are hoping to go undetected. But their hope is in vain, as our eyes are now accustomed to the snow. In the dark night, Soviet forces, the strength of one battalion, march toward our positions. Their actions are unfathomable. Our outposts detect them, and within 100 metres they are smashed to a pulp by the combined fire of our vigilant company. They cover the bottom of the basin in a wildly gruesome pile, at the point where death met them while fleeing or marching. We press forward towards Saikin and Plotawo. In the villages, the site after our attack is not any different. Corpses, nothing but corpses. The penetrating Soviet forces suffer immeasurable blood sacrifices. The immense red losses give too easily the wrong impression that our fight here in the East is not that difficult. To the contrary, the true picture of the enemy goes like this, tough, stubborn and malicious. It will never be possible to describe in words the deprivation and exertion that we have suffered during these defensive fights led by our brave infantry comrades. A deep layer of snow covers the ground, and we have to fight for each step that we take. The icy cold temperature freezes our limbs solid, and our fingers would stick to metal if we were to touch it with our bare hands. In front of us, Gotche Goroka is burning. It still has to be captured today. The red defence is tough, and for some of us, this is the hour in which our life becomes fulfilled. In this burning village, where there is not a single house that remains standing, our company will spend the night. Where? Next to a smouldering beam, in a snow hole, in a wind-sheltered corner of a remnant of a house that still stands? The only thing we know is that we will indeed spend the night here, despite the cold, despite the privation. Will the supply trucks follow us? Or will we have to set up camp where there is no camp, and with our stomachs growling? Will we awake after a freezing night with frost-bitten limbs, and sense nothing like a warm tea, a warm meal, until, if the attack does not continue, supplies have reached us? Maybe we will just chew on the hard zwieback of our iron rations, and try to thaw the frozen meat in tin cans. Orders take us to Jekaterinoka, to secure the Rashawa battery. Approaching from the south, two regiments, who are relying on Group Dossler, are moving into the 40 kilometres gap. But the Russians have also been able to bring in strong forces. Bitter fighting takes place, the outcome of which is of absolute importance to Charkow and Kursk. Our own tanks are rolling behind us. Stukas successfully enter the combat. In a tough wrestling match, our regiments succeed in pushing the enemy slowly to the east. We are marching straight through the embattled area. The field of corpses that is left behind in the occupied villages is wretched. The black dots that cover the distant snowfields cannot find any graves. Who is supposed to dig into this ground, which is frozen solid two metres deep? Who is supposed to collect the innumerable Soviets? We are the only ones digging graves for our own comrades. An explosive charge pushes up the hard earth, and across in the snow, forged by the men's hard fists, pays witness to the fact that somebody here has given his life in this never-ending battle in the East. And so the victorious battle rages on, as the Soviet reserves bleed to death. We know that the resistance is not as strong everywhere else as it is in this particular area, where the Soviets want to force them to break through with all of their might. We are standing at the focal point of the Eastern Front, but at least we know that at this particular point, there will be no decisive success by the Soviets. On the road at 40 degrees C, 1.5 metres of snow and an ice storm. Toward the evening, we reach Jekaterinoka. As we are frozen solid to the bone, we set up camp as quickly as possible. Camping in the village, now that sounds cosy. A warm lamp and a crackling fire, a solid bed, a soothing drink, bacon and eggs. France, you are so far away. This is the reality. You push open the door and immediately have to duck, 
because otherwise you would smash your head into a wooden beam. If you are lucky enough to pick your quarters, a hot stench assaults you, rests on your suffocating lungs and chest, and a sluggish cow, which has been lying on warm, soaked straw, raises her head. Only then will you enter through another door into the actual living room, where now a briny odour surrounds you. But your nose has long since been dulled against all these smells, and even if it were only just months ago, you had thought it impossible to endure such emanations for even half an hour. You see quite realistically now that the stove is burning, and there is enough space for you and your comrades. In the flickering light of a candlestick, there is the familiar picture. Sprawled above the stove, a farmer is in hibernation next to the chickens, and a malenki, a small pig. Now, between these rags and the rubbish on the stove bench, there are a few children's heads moving, staring at you with large eyes. And even the children, too, appear to you like strange animals, dirty, crawling and slithering, but under no condition human. God, if these were the only living creatures living in this house! The candle dies down, and now the house pets start to emerge from every corner. Bugs, fleas and lice, the hours become torturous and suffering. Not a thought of getting some refreshing forty winks, as now they are all stuck to your clothes. Day after day you go lice hunting. Forty, fifty, and even three times more is the daily loot. And how disgusting is the scurrying of the mice, which the winter forces from the fields into the houses, and who are now racing and whisking with their thin whistle all over your body and face as soon as you lie down. On this particular night, the mice chew fist-sized holes into the pockets of my coat, which I wear while I sleep. There were small remnants of zwieback in the pockets, pieces of my iron ration. The next morning you get up, only to be confronted once again with the reality of how soiled and dirty this quarter is, how all the tools are covered in goop and full of dung, how disgustingly greasy the table is, how gummed up the benches are, and yet you are still grateful to have encountered such good quarters. In the villages on the front, there where our last security forces lie, the picture is a completely different one. There, misery resides in every hut, there is no straw to be found, and at night you put your coat on the cracking ice-cold ground, or you pack yourself onto a hard wooden table. And yes, the bugs have taken refuge from the cold in the cracks of the planks. In their place, however, the mice and rats hunt through the living room unafraid, and in broad daylight, which allows you to club down ten or even twenty of them. This doesn't matter, and makes little difference. You can also see lice taking a walk in the broad daylight. They crawl upon you, and you are unable to defend yourself. And here on the front, you must also be prepared at any hour for a hailstorm of fire to come over you, or for a sudden attack from the Reds in the middle of the cold, stiff night, or to be aroused from the urgently needed sleep, because perhaps a few houses down there might appear out of the blue an enemy reconnaissance patrol. During the afternoon, our units clear out. Tomorrow morning, we will march back to Obajan, where new tasks await us. We use the few hours of quiet to finally write a letter home. Who knows when these few lines will reach our loved ones back home? Snowdrifts several metres high have made it impossible for the vehicles to pass through the roads. Watch patrol at midnight. Billions of stars hang in the ice-cold winter sky. Once in a while a shooting star falls in a glimmering path. Wish for something, foot soldier, if that spark of an old childhood dream is even still alive in you. With lightning speed, a thought of the holidays crosses my mind. But that silly dream is nothing but a memory. Those days were already over when the shooting star announced coming happiness. This war silences all such hope. Far in the distance, bright fire illuminates the sky. It returns often, and a few seconds later, the muffled sounds of the artillery rumbles over us. Over there, our comrades are confronting the enemy. At this very moment, they are probably ducking into a snow hole to avoid the howling song of the enemy's shells, or their bodies will rise like shadows out of the ground, storming forward to attack. Departure for Obajan. Strong snowstorm. We are supposed to have two days of rest, since on the 24th we are supposed to take our position with Lieutenant Hegner in Woroshiloa. Not much needs to be logged during these days. Weapons and equipment are inspected and we catch up on a lot of sleep. When the mail comes through on the 23rd, there is overwhelming joy. 
At night, there is hardly any sleep because the heavy 100-pound bombs are thundering down on the city until the early hours of the morning. On our way to Woroshiloa, attacks from Russian fighters and bombers. At night, we set up camp in a piss-poor, godforsaken village. Exhausted to death and half-frozen, we wrap ourselves in blankets, sleeping, just sleeping. A telegram rips us from our uneasy slumber. God damn it. Is there no rest at all to be had by us? Strong enemy forces threaten the area around Woroshiloa. We have to march tonight. Again, out into the cold, fighting over and over, fighting. Is there anything else for us? Thank God the road is good and there are only small snowdrifts. The Sturmpionieren have been able to hold them open for the ammunition and supply convoys. These brave men too achieve the impossible here. We will never forget these quiet, faithful helpers and pathfinders in the truest sense of the word. Despite the brightness of the moon, we are unable to discern anything around us. The many dark spots along the side of the road. Are they piles of sand which have been hauled in here from afar by the Sturmpionieren during the day and stored there, or are they dead horses? One really doesn't look there anymore, as everybody is occupied with himself and we have all seen enough horse cadavers, thankfully frozen, slashed by the sharp beaks of birds which now line the streets in the east. One hardly looks out over the vast plain, where on the horizon between the forest and the icy river gorges, where the enemy's gun flashes as well as our own, light up the sky, a distant fire display toward which we are moving in a silent march. Still five kilometres to Woroshiloa. We know that when they say five, they mean ten. Misleading us is the trump card of these forced marches. We listen to shot after shot. In between the sometimes loud and sometimes quiet strikes, we drift off into our thoughts. We make it through an area of forest. We are wishing that we were finally at the front in our ditches and dugouts. Not only because the temperature has fallen below 35 degrees C. No, much more so because we know that the enemy is directly in front of us over there. Here on the road, he is everywhere, lying in snow holes and bushes waiting to ambush us, shooting from his traps and burying wooden mines along his way. Woroshiloa, a heap of rubble amongst a pathetic trench system, our new position. The daily assault from the shells does not allow the snow to stay on the ground for long. As our comrades tell us, this can also be considered a front-line position, because every day something burns down here the flames at least giving us some much-needed warmth. Besides the shelling and the artillery fire, nothing much happens today. On the other side, as well as here, men are resting from yesterday's major offensive. There is an incident during the afternoon, unimportant as such, but one that nevertheless leaves us in a state of unrest. An enemy patrol has succeeded in approaching very near to our position. We observe them unknowingly for a while until they throw a few hand grenades fleeing before we are able to recognise them and fire. Far in the distance we notice a few figures in snowcoats disappear and vanish. Nothing can be done to them anymore. The dry sputtering of a machine gun is much too late. The snow splashes up high from the impact of the bullets and dissolves into the sunlight. But the patrol has long since disappeared behind a depression in the ground. Us Frontschweiner indeed possess a sixth sense by now and it is telling us that very soon all hell is going to break loose, and this mess is going to start all over. In the neighbouring area close to the Sturmpionieren, who are holding the position up to the road, the anxiety is obvious. And when the food service arrives with the evening soup, the machine guns next door are wildly sputtering again. We are in the middle of filling our plates, but are still keeping our ears alert. Anti-aircraft fire now enters the developing battle. And shortly after, when the infantry rifles come alive and the first listening post returns with the news that something is happening over there, everybody drops their spoons, grabs their weapons and helmets, and goes over to the post, where the men there eye sharply the encroaching darkness of night. In the meantime, the artillery too has heard that something is happening up on the front. Heavy shells are shuffling through the air and crashing down among the enemy's trenches. There is a hellish uproar when, to the left of the road, anti-aircraft artillery, which has taken position there, starts sending their lightning missiles hammering and roaring toward the enemy. Now everybody knows. And because a breakthrough with heavy tanks, even to a small extent, concerns us all, 
there is a sudden widespread and silent abandonment of the evening soup. The company does not need to wait much longer for the hard work to begin. It must begin. How is it that our fingers become stiff at the trigger and will not curve through at the decisive moment? Yes, so much so that some even lower their weapon or machine gun, confused, only to stare ahead, not knowing what is happening to them. Damn, is this possible? These troops are Feldgrau groups, companies who flood through the enemy ditches, waving and calling in their German helmets. Is this possible? Are we being fooled by a nightly spook? But we are all fully alert. A lieutenant colonel, the leader of the infantry, jumps out of the trench. Stop! What is the password? Which regiment? In the meantime, we have to adjust our scopes with trembling fingers. 200, 150, 100. But nobody from the other side gives an answer, which results in a rush of men who are storming, waving and calling. It's at that moment that the leader of the company jumps back into the trench and gives orders to fire with thin lips. We are shooting with clammy fingers, shooting faster and faster with the fixed sight. In a second, the mirage is over. The calls and orders from over there sound blurry and strange all of a sudden. These aren't German men or German commandos. No German infantryman jumps like that. Finally, a united defensive fire hammers into the advancing masses, despite the Feldgrau uniform and helmets. We shoot into them with intense and rabid bitterness. If only no more new masses, who are no longer in German uniforms, would swell over the wide field of snow. Hundreds of Soviets scurry at us, clumped together and then break apart to be shot down. With new ones continually breaking away from their positions, these are no longer companies. These are battalions and regiments. How long will we be able to hold out? Is there enough ammunition? How is our supply of hand grenades should it come to the bitter end? But don't dwell on unnecessary thoughts. Stay calm and hold out. All through the night the fighting continues. Their reserves seem to be invincible. Only this morning brings some calm along with reinforcements. A rifle company arrives and, despite their exhausting march, immediately takes position on our thin line. Strong patrol activity on both sides. The Reds are preparing for new attacks. Heavy losses from the low-altitude attacks of the Bolshevik fighteries and bombers. Late in the afternoon, more reinforcements arrive. Infantry and two centimetres anti-aircraft artillery. After the attacks during the night, which were quite strong indeed, it is now calm. The Reds must have suffered tremendous losses. Corpses are lying in heaps in front of our positions. Our 8.8 .8 anti-tank cannons destroyed three tanks. One of them was an extra heavy one. Reconnaissance units return and bring news that the enemy's tanks, along with their infantry units, are retreating to the northeast. A counterattack is ordered for tonight. At the same time, we receive orders to march to a different sector. Scheisse, it is always the same. When the danger is over, we are no longer needed. It is always the same fool's story. I am curious which fire we have to put out now. Shizyojedno! Never before have I been so aware of the unimaginable vastness of the Russian countryside than now, when the forests and fields are covered by a huge white shroud. For the first time in a long while, the ice-cold whistling is quiet today. It isn't snowing, and thus for the first time we are able to see the incredible vastness of this space. The eye reaches the horizon without being able to stop at one point. A seemingly endless white plain stretches ahead without interruption, or so it seems, for the deep gorges that cut through the land are hidden by the snow. The Reds have secret hiding places. Here, hidden from the naked eye, right in the villages, is the enemy's line. Here, along the upper Donets, is Griasnoye, a small, nondescript village, over which we fought for weeks. The Bolsheviks nearly succeeded in bringing the village into their possession, but at the decisive moment, the sheer will and bravery of the German soldier ensured victory. But now it is all quiet here. This time we have not been called in to be the fire brigade. Medium artillery attacks, a few visits from aircraft, every other night a light attack, that is all. And it's a good thing, because the last few weeks have treated us badly, completely on their own, here as well as in innumerable other places on the Eastern Front, which stretches for thousands of kilometres the occupying army fights their daily battles. The village with its sad huts is our chateau, 
which we defend together with a company of infantrymen. Last night we had to defend against a particularly vicious attack from the Reds. There was bitter close-range combat, and two good comrades were killed in action. The company leader of the infantrymen, a World War I veteran, and an old fighter of the Eastern Front, tells us about the old times. The present war is much more brutal than the Great War 25 years ago, for we are now encountering a fanatical enemy over there on the other side. No one surrenders. Both sides will fight until the last bullet. More than anything, though, is us being overcome right at this moment, due to the vastness of the space, by a feeling of utter abandonment. Confidence in our own power is the only thing that gives us hope for victory. We can hardly count on help or support from our neighbours. We only possess the villages, while the fields in between them, where night after night, day after day, tough battles are fought, are a no-man's land. There is no well-defined positioning system like there once was during the Great War, because the ground was already hard as stone when the German advance was halted. Due to the lack of a contiguous front line, it is possible for the enemy to circumvent individual positions and attack us from the rear or from our flanks. To this, add the difficulty of the terrain, which is traversed by numerous gorges, offering favourable circumstances for the attackers. All of this causes our nerves to be strained to their limits, as every night we experience numerous house battles and ambushes. Much too often, just like here in Granoye, we have to refrain from using barbed wire barriers because the villages are so spread out. Relentless is the battle to seize each individual house, since those pathetic huts are the only protection from the cold. This is also why such dwellings are equipped on their sides with firing ports, so that as soon as the enemy attempts to infiltrate the village, our fierce fire is able to assault them from all sides.